story goes forward from here, as you all know. At least those of you who are not carrying iPhones, where you know there's a premium associated with that device. Let's measure reputation. In this uh, illustration, which comes from Intellectual Asset Management magazine to be, that will come out in the June issue of this year, there are a number of ways to manage reputation, uh, measure reputation. The most common is the survey. Uh, Fortune magazine has been publishing for many years the world's most admired companies. Forbes magazine, not to be outdone, publishes the world's most reputable companies and derives their data from the Reputation Institute. The Harris Organization, which is one of the oldest polling organizations in the world, publishes lists of the um, uh, most respected companies. Major surveys. Another way to determine reputation is to look at media tone. How is the media covering these firms? There's a firm called Vano that publishes a media metric, another firm called Predictive. There are expert panels. Interbrand publishes every year the brand value of various companies, a very well-respected list. Ethisphere magazine publishes their list, and I mentioned that Johnson & Johnson was at the top of their list for most ethical companies as well. The market has its view. Stock price captures all value, and so stock price is a driver. And then there's a tool that we use at Steel City Re, which is an expectation link behavior uh, and decision market, which draws on the analysis of cash implications from various decision markets. What we have found is that there is a remarkably strong correlation between these reputational expectations and economic performance. So all of these various indicators that I mentioned to you, this chart shows the correlation coefficient of those reputational metrics and the periodic return on equity of the various companies that they have ranked as being reputable companies. And you'll see that the correlation is first positive, which is a good thing, and second can be as high as 60 or 70 percent. In our experience, the Harris survey shows the closest correlation with economic return. The Harris survey also does a very good job of, of discriminating among companies. So companies that are highly ranked on the Harris survey outperform those that are lesser ranked, which outperform those that are even lesser ranked, and finally outperform those that are at the bottom of the ranking. Very meaningful discriminating uh, record. So looking at the returns uh, between May of 2008 and May 2009, in which the markets as a whole lost value, the black bar shows the S&P 500, a reasonable indicator of overall market behavior. The market lost 37%, a bad year for all. In that environment, the companies that the Harris survey ranked as the highest reputation only lost about 25%. The second quartile lost about 29%, whereas the fourth quartile lost an excess of 50%. So again, affirming a very close correlation between reputation and economic performance for all the background reasons explained previously. Turning now to one of the last points in Pierre's slide about risk management in terms of intangible assets. Risk and reputation management, from our perspective, is process engineering. It means establishing best practices. It means monitoring and enforcing compliance, which is a feedback loop where you must measure and must manage. It means looking for, for, that is forecasting and mitigating both operational risks and what we refer to as headline risks, risks that not, might not be something considered by a company but for the fact that being on the headline of a newspaper creates an operational and stakeholder risk. And this is in part addressed through and managed by communications and communications and did I mention communications with all stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, one example, Hewlett Packard. In February 2005 after some internal ethical matters where the board ended up spying on itself which suggests a governance, a core governance problem, um, Hewlett Packard removed its uh, then CEO, removed its then chairman, um, and eventually, uh, and, and, oh, and also lost 30% of its market cap, brings in a new team in September 2006. The red circle here marks 2007. So beginning of 2007, Hewlett Packard publishes, communicates to its stakeholders that they have a new highly transparent governance program and that never again will the chairman spy on the CEO, will the CEO spy on a board member, and so on. 
that they will have practices and sustainability, that they will be ethical, that they will focus on safety, and most important, as always, they will pursue the core value of Hewlett Packard, which is innovation. And when they published that declarative statement and communicated transparently to their stakeholders their new values on, to bolster, bolster their reputation, you'll see that the black chart up above shows their stock price movement, the red line shows their intangible asset metric line, the gray line shows how their peers performed. So they greatly outperformed the S&P, they greatly outperformed their peers because of the value of reputation and its communication to their stakeholders. In the general case, firms that are superior managers of their intangible assets and build a superior reputation will experience higher sales, will have higher net incomes, will have higher earnings multiples, will have more stable stock prices, and will show greater resilience in down markets because of their reputations. I will wrap up with a quick case study of three comparable pharma companies, Novartis, Pfizer, and Lilly. Uh, Novartis was just also ranked by Ethisphere as being the most ethical pharmaceutical house in the world as of uh, spring 2009. The red line above shows their reputation index. It has been hovering fairly high at about 0.93 on a scale of 0 to 1. They're in the high end of the scale. Their volatility, as shown in the lower chart, is fairly small, measuring no more than two orders of magnitude. Financially, they are outperforming their peers in the pharmaceutical space by about 13% in terms of return on equity, much higher return. The blue line is their return on equity over the black line, which is the S&P, and the white dots are the median return of that sector. Now, we compare that to Pfizer, which is a lesser ranking from a, in, from a reputational perspective it has been very stable over the past year. They have done nothing great. They have done nothing bad. Their volatility, as you can see, is again about two orders of magnitude showing around the 100 line. They are slightly, if not matching the, the median for their peers, beating them out by about half a percent return on equity. Now look at the last firm, Lilly. Lilly had a reputational issue. They had an ethical issue. Lilly's marketing program was a little aggressive, and they marketed a, a psychoactive drug to a market that was, it was for which the product was not indicated. The result was a $1.4 billion fine. That drop in, the, uh, in their value, that precipitous drop in the blue line associated with a slight drop in the reputation line marks the point where the fine was levied against them. Lilly is a huge company with an overall good reputation, and you'll see resilience by virtue of their reputation rising. Overall, though, they still underperform their peers by about 3%. The consequence of having a slip in, it, in a reputational element that you expect from an ethical pharmaceutical firm, which happens to be, in this case, ethics. So to wrap up the business case, firms that manage their reputation superbly because of the impact of reputation on those core drivers of value, will recognize cost savings, will recognize revenue uh, enhancements, will avoid adverse events, and will overall recognize enterprise value changes that are positive because of the laudable effects of superior reputations, which produces lovely charts that can be measured, and because they can be measured, they can be managed. And that perhaps is one of the most important messages of this entire intangible asset focus on finance. So in summary, reputation has significant economic value. It is the product of intangible asset management. Numerous companies and their boards have had failures, we'll say in risk management, associated with failures in business processes, which are the output of intellectual property. They need measurement systems. They need management systems. I would hope that the Institute will develop custom systems for firms as different sectors require more unique micro-level uh, forms of tracking, measurement, and control. Overall, holistic intellectual property management comprises board-level reputation protection, operational-level tangible and intangible asset monetization, because the benefits of superior management and measurement include value enhancement, protection, and recovery. Thank you.